management of kids and lambs, which is a very, very uh, basic and important topic for all of us to understand about sheep and goat uh, production and ruminant production. As we all know uh, that uh, India has got a wonderful livestock uh, resource for, with us. So we have almost 550 million livestock, out of which 148 goats and 74 sheep. Uh, so almost uh, we can say that 40% uh, of our livestock comes from small ruminants. Uh, India is right now producing 9.77 million tons of meat. And the growth rate in case of small ruminant is almost 5.13 percentage. And the per capita ability of meat has increased from 5 kgs to 7 kgs right now. And this is the per capita per annum uh, meat consumption of every Indian. And if you see globally, one of the best countries like uh, uh, USA and all, no, they are uh, China and all. They are almost 45, 50, some have, but still higher than that. So we have a lot of work to do in future. Almost, say we can take this to almost 8 to 10 times more. That much of potential is there. Why I'm saying this is that all the future students who are attending this webinar, they must be knowing that there is tremendous work available in small ruminant production. It is totally untouched field. Factors such as price of the meat and uh, price of the egg or price of the milk, which is generally controlled by government, is not here. So that advantage is there. And uh, we have wonderful uh, feed resources right now available in the form of uh, meat, uh, grass and uh, grains and crop residues and industrial byproducts. So whatever we have understood in cattle and buffalo production, the same principles can be applied and we can take the meat production to a very, very high level and we can, you know, satisfy the needs of our country and people. See, as per the uh, statistics, almost 52% of the meat is coming right now from poultry and 11 from sheep and 15 from goat and rest 18% it comes from buffaloes and this meager, you know, 4% is coming from the uh, pigs. So this uh, statistics one is one statistic is very important that when we calculate the protein from all sources, milk, meat and egg, you know, the availability is very, very less, meager 0.3 grams per kg body weight, whereas the requirement is almost three times of that, one gram per kg body weight. So this is very crucial because we have the requirement and the demand is not met. We have people who are supposed to be consuming this high quality protein and it is not available. So this I consider as a very, very good challenge for all of us to learn and produce the uh, precious meat for the country. And we know that uh, protein which is uh, come from the word proteum, that is first nutrient of concern. And especially from livestock origin, it has got a very high biological value, that is milk, meat and egg and fish. And this is needed for growth, health, repair and longevity of the nutrition. Without this high biological value protein, we are having a tendency to suffer from lifestyle diseases. And it creates a vicious cycle of ill health, weakness, disease burden, and uh, which leads to a very, very costly and ineffective treatment uh, model. You know, all these people and ultimately end up in going to the hospitals. And there, their money is uh, going, but the end result is uh, the patient gets some mental satisfaction for some time, but uh, he loses a lot of money and he comes back to the home with the same health and with some mental satisfaction, I must say, because he has spent a lot of money from his pocket. So this insufficient protein on a daily basis is leading to loss of uh, body mass. It is replaced by body fat and then it is leading to disability and then one or the other uh, diseases there are. So we know that the growth of sheep, uh, sheep and goat population is increasing by 2% and the meat is increasing by uh, almost uh, of the meat is going to be around 12, 12 million tons, uh, which is going to be by 2050. And there is a huge demand of around say 20% uh, from supply side. So the gap has to be met. And uh, some basic statistics like Every year we slaughter around 35 to 40 percent of the sheep and goat existing. That's how the population is growing at two to three percent per annum. And uh, 
80% of the income come from the sale of lambs, the rest remaining come from wool and manure. Okay. And the expected uh, uh, lambing and uh, getting percentage is around 160 lambs per 100 ewes in one year. So that is a very good uh, successful model, we say. And uh, prices are increasing by almost 50% for this metal and shivan. And uh, every year we are getting a higher price. Right now it is in Bidar around 700 rupees per kg is the cost of mutton and chivan. And the only solution which is left in front of us to go for increase production of small ruminants and increase the meat. Otherwise, we will be having still further increased prices. And uh, water site, you know, why we are not able to do some good justice is because uh, the land which is under water is static from last 20 years at 8.5 4 million hectares out of the 165 million hectares India is possessing that is known as cultivable land under agriculture. We are just having some 5% for uh, almost uh, you can say 50 crore uh, animals and rest 95% is going for cultivation of grains, fruits and vegetables for 140 crore people. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, food which is produced from livestock, 150 crore livestock. Uh, that is again in turn producing milk, meat, and then egg, and it is also going for human consumption. So that uh, concept has to become very, very clear. So due to our own ignorance and lack of knowledge, and at ICR level, there is a lot of uh, biasness towards animal husbandry. I must uh, be very, very clear here saying this on national webinar that, uh, you know, we are not getting a fair share of budget and importance and understanding of this animal husbandry component. Right? We have been taught from our first year BBSC 25 years back that animal husbandry and agriculture, they are subsidiary to each other and animal husbandry is supposed to be there from top residue and agricultural leftovers and agriculture is meant for satisfying the needs of people hunger and all. It was okay, say around up to 1990s, 1995 and all because 19... 47 British left us in a very, very poor state and it was artificially created. I must say on record here that it was not uh, that we had a less supply of food grains. It was created. We all know the history very well. And uh, 1990 onwards, we have woken up to the world reality of globalization and uh, 2014 onwards, we have really started taking, picking up and uh, this... Uh, Concept has to be slightly, if you ask me, this land has to be having, you know, a bigger share. We can have a very good uh, animal husbandry if we can have land diverted for crop production and fodder production rather than, you know, taking them on uh, residue production system. That is the reason of low production in our country and no other reason. We cannot say that our livestock are poor genetics and it has got a poor average building it is just because we are not giving them good appropriate required nutrients hence is the low production so due to this uh, you know faulty production system what we are having the lamb mortality or kids mortality is going up to 25 percent it is reported by Prof. Sarpi and Karim and Sankhan authors that it's a very high mortality and uh, we have been working in last since last 25 years in uh, these uh, sectors of animal husbandry and uh, I must say that uh, we didn't had even 1% of uh, mortality livestock but in the field this is the uh, data reported and among humans you know which have got a lot of importance the mortality rate is almost 0.7% uh, that is uh, you can say 7 per thousand so so much of scope is there for all of veterinarians and uh, animal husbandry people to take care both from uh, their <clears throat> feed as well as the health point of view. And uh, dressing percentage of 50 to 52 percent is reported. And uh, the housing requirement also, the uh, space requirement of two square meter per sheep or goat and one square meter in covered space, even that is also highly challenged in most of the sheep and goat areas. So we are challenged in all ways, housing, feeding, and uh, hygiene and uh, so somehow that with this all these things we are getting uh, the present growth rate what we'll be discussing in coming slides and uh, I must say here that you know you cannot just say that uh, we are concerned for lamb and eve uh, kids health the eve and the doe's health goes together with the young one's health so 
what i want to tell you is that you have to have a very good mother first to have a good hand lamp so one basic uh, yardstick which we generally see in flock uh, health is the body condition score uh, the blood and the body weight everything is fine but when we look at the animal and when we can touch the animal by having our hand on the sacral region on the lumbar sacral region we can generally feel the bone and muscle and the fat uh, one is generally a uh, it is uh, body condition score is generally done in one to five scale. One is skin and bone, and five is a very obese animal. So, our aim of maintaining the whole flock health should be in such a way that you must have the breeding taking place at 3.5 body condition score because uh, we have the role of hormones coming after this. You know, the growth of fetus is at the cost of. Uh, mother's health also sometimes the body reserves are diverted for the growth of fetus so we want a very high body condition score at the time of breeding only because after that if uh, uh, that late pregnancy the body condition score is bound to come to a three and uh, at lambing 2.5 because the stress of the fetus will be there and the dry matter intake of the e will be compromised so that is the time the body reserves are mobilized and two months post lactation post lambing the lactation stress is very high so in spite of all the better management and all from 3.5 it is bound to come to 2 and that is the time when we uh, tell the lambs of kids to be weaned from the mother and there onwards again the body condition has to be uh, it picks up because the reserves and the nutrients are all going towards milk production they all get stopped there is no milk production and the body reserves get filled up by that simple mechanism. So here this intervention of doing uh, breeding at 3 body, point five body condition is a very, very crucial thing. Before that, we are not supposed to breed the animal. Otherwise, our entire further planning becomes fail. We, we have to keep on treating the sick animals otherwise. And there will not be much milk and so on and so forth. So... Uh, before telling to the health of the lambs and kids, and uh, first of all, I, this is my favorite topic. You know, you all must agree that animal husbandry depends a lot on fodder production, and fodder production is highly compromised. I always argue with my agriculture friends that you are doing too much injustice. You know, you are always uh, producing a lot of grains, fruits, and whatnot. You know, sugar, so much of sugar is produced, which is not at all needed by human beings. And there is such a good food which is needed for us, that is milk, meat, and egg. You're not producing, you're not doing anything. You know, are they not? So who is responsible for it? Agriculture people say, since a cro uh, crop is going for animal husbandry, why should we produce fodder? Let them uh, survive on the crop residue only. But this will not work. Anything which is uh, right will come up in one or the other form. And uh, one or the other day, we have to realize the importance of animal husbandry. And uh, in coming slides, I'll substantiate my talk that why it is so important. Right. So, and uh, the data is also so confusing. Some people say that the shortage is 10%. Again, government agencies. Few other government agencies say that the data is deficient to the tune of 65%. So, out of 100 kgs for available, we have just 35 kgs available. Rest 65 is not available at all. And this is a government of India fire plan report. It says that we are deficient every year by 65% of green. And some basics about photo production that uh, we all know that uh, we have three types of photo, curry, shrubby, and summer. So they are taken as per the season. Rainy season, we have curry and rabi in winter. And summer, we call it also call it a Z crop also. So the crops which are grown in these seasons are cowpea, field bean, bajra, sorghum, maize. And in Rabi, Bursin, Jusin, Oats and Barley. And during summer, we have either of the crops. And the crops are also classified based on whether it is a single cut or a multi cut, uh, that is perennial or annual basis, and whether it is a legume or non legume. In Canada, we call it as Vidar uh, uh, Dhan, uh, basically, they are uh, rich in protein. Vidar uh, Dhanya is rich in protein and and uh, non-legumes are rich in energy. 
So we call in simple words we call it as serials, and here we call it as pulses. And uh, in the fodder crop we call them as legumes and non-legumes. And uh, the bursin, kaupi, stylo, door, etc. are the legumes, and non-legumes are <coughs> bajra, sorghum, and Abinapier, oats, and all kinds of plants such as roots, paragraphs, everything. We know that uh, we have a, a harvesting season for the entire year. So that should be the technology how you have to uh, produce a fodder. So uh, we, uh, as per the season, you have to go for sowing, and the first cut is generally taken at 60 to 65 days in case of legumes and 75 days in case of non-legumes because uh, and the subsequent cuts are taken every month or 20 days. The yield is around say you can say uh, legumes are 20 to 30 and non-legumes 100 tons and the overall yield is say around overall yield is uh, you know uh, so much of water I am producing 200 tons of water I am producing and uh, uh, you don't need any concentrate nothing and uh, the monthly income after having all your expenditures done it is around one lakh rupees per month two lakh rupees per year which any class manager state officer is uh, getting these days as salaries and just from one acre if it is managed well see so much of potential is there and we are not understood it and just feeding the animals on crop residue and uh, uh, keeping them at uh, whatever production level, we had to change. Like we had uh, when 1992 onwards, we went for globalization. Likewise, we have to go for very high system of inputs and high systems of output. Otherwise, our animals are equally capable. We know that uh, adult animal require around uh, 4 kg of uh, finely chopped one to 2 cm fodder in the form of green. And uh, as a thumb rule, we say that two thirds should come from non legumes and one third should come from legumes, and uh, soil feeding should not be done from either case. And if possible, uh, if you want to go for you know high uh, dry matter intake, then try to make the water as little as possible. Freshly cut water will generally have 85 90 percent of moisture, and uh, if you dry it in the sun and bring the moisture, so say 40 percent. 30%, as little as possible. Hay has got 10% moisture. And uh, so that our dry matter intake in the ruminants increases. So wherever there is increased dry matter intake, there is a better nutrient available to the animals, along with the digestibility, like Advent has got 65, 70% digestibility. As a thumb rule, you know, these non legumes are rich in energy, and uh, ruminants are energy. They want energy. And in case of human beings, they don't protein because of the inert mechanism of presence of ruminants they have. The rumen has got a lot of microbes. Whatever the cow eat in the form of grass and hay and crop residue is eaten by microbes. And those microbes have got a shelf life for only 2-10 hours. And they go to abomasum, that is the true stomach, and supply all the protein to the cow. That's how the protein sources of the cows are met. And uh, that's why the ruminant is highly respected and praised in our culture. It is considered as God also sometimes because out of nowhere, it is creating protein for the survival of the human beings. So we have the very good culture of worshipping and uh, keeping this uh, species in a very, very high level. So to get this uh, uh, fodder throughout the year from that one acre of land, which is very well irrigated, and getting uh, after removing, uh, you have around 2 to 2.5 lakh rupees of returns. And let us assume it is a very intensive system of cultivation where there is a lot of input. Still, that 50 percent can be diverted towards uh, you know crop production housing labor payment everything still we can have a lot of profit that's what i want to emphasize here so the whole uh land whatever you have one acre or ten acres or whatever you have you convert that into eight plots even that one single plot can be converted into one or two plots so no one one third or half of and at every 15 days interval you keep on sowing uh, whatever is required because once you get the crop it will come for almost 15 days you can freshly cut it and eat it and if still that is getting excess you can convert it into the form of hay and silage so this will uh, ensure that you have got continuous flow of green water supply for the animals within the allocated area and each crop may be 
uh, uh, both the legumes and non legumes can be taken and you have to sow in the interval of 10 days or 14 days interval so this is how what is the magic of uh, you know regular supply of crop production that you have to divide the existing land into eight plots and that one plot also can be divided into half plot and at every 15th day you have to take up the sowing so by the time you finish the first uh, one sixteenth of plot, the second sixteenth of plot will be ready for feeding to the animals. So sixteen, and we feed it for fifteen days, or say uh, twenty days. So that take care of our entire year's crop supply. And uh, now we also have got very good, uh, you know, leguminous uh, waters also. So they have uh, available uh, like uh, lucerne food, CO two variety, CO three variety, and CO four variety, and uh, they are. Polycross derivatives involving CO1 and uh, all have got uh, CO1 variety. And it is a perennial crop and the harvest is almost 130 tons. It's a challenge for all of us because generally we say that 20 25 tons is the harvest, but these are all new varieties which are coming to market. And uh, the protein content is also very high, say around 23 24, all of this thing. And a dry matter of around say, 16 to 20 percentage of the dry matter in the yield of this crop. And the special feature of this lucent uh, core CO2 is that it has got more number of stem per crown with soft and dark brown green leaves. And a dry matter yield of around 24 tons per hectare per year. So that uh, one 30 tons is the harvest, but uh, the dry matter is uh, devoid of moisture. So I can say that 15% is the dry matter content. So that comes to 20. Well, the, this is the actual nutrient available to them, 21 tons. And the rest all is moisture. And uh, the flowering is very profuse and uh, it has got a superior retuning ability. And early flowering gives a 15 harvest per year, so every 10 or 15 days, you can say, uh, 20 days maximum, you can take first half, uh, you can cut and, uh, and highly palatable and highly preferred by ruminants. But uh, since we are talking of now intensive cultivation, the uh, audience should always know that the input is also very, very intensive. See, like uh, I've been telling that the sheep and goat are produced on low input system right now. So to have high input system, you have to have high uh, quality food to the animals. Likewise, to the soil also, when you are talking of such a high yield, 200 metric tons per hectare. Okay, when we are students, we even, didn't even get 20 tons. Now we are taking 10 times more yield from the same soil due to you know, continuous selection and crossbreeding and hybrid uh, varieties and all. So when you are taking 10 times more nutrients from the soil, the replenishment of the soil has to be more. Only then you can get such an intensive cultivation system. Please know that we need almost 25 tons. So each uh, uh, vehicle contains around 10 tons of each uh, lorry, we say, you know, 10 tons of farmyard manure there. So two and a half lorries of farmyard manure is needed per acre per year per hectare per year at least five tons per acre ten tons per acre we don't even put one ton also now where is the yield coming if there is no yield coming where is the crop coming if no crop is coming where are we going to be to our animals and where are we going to take such a high yield of one lakh rupees per so it's all related you cannot ignore the soil component water component crop component and after harvesting we feed to the animals. So this is a very intensive system of production. In case of uh, western countries it is working because they really work intensively. But in our country are we ready to go for this kind of production system? Yeah, you have got 500 million cattle and buffaloes. What are we doing with their dung? It is just, you know, and all the press mud which is coming from the sugarcane industries. Along with that, we also have some, you know, uh, you know, deficient nutrients in the form of NPK. That has to also be replenished to almost say around 185 kgs per hectare or say 70 kgs per hectare per year. So 
you first put Fajmiyar Mandal and blow the land two, three times. And uh, take the crop. After every crop, you have to go for, say, around 5 kgs, 10 kgs, 20 kgs per acre of NPK in the ratio of 25, 120, and 40 kgs because the uh, soil is deficient in these micronutrients like NPK. Otherwise, uh, the soil is very good in CHN. Okay? And the seed rate is <laughs> this much, so 10 kgs per hectare, spacing of 25 centimeters. And whenever there is a weeding required, you can always go for time weeding, you know. And by this system, we are going to get, say, 192, say, around 130 tons of yield, or you can say 40 tons of yield in some 14 to 12. <coughs> These are some of the photographs where we generally produce good product. And that's what is related to the Eve's health, and that is what will contribute to the lamb and kids' health, and it will reduce the lambs and kids' mortality and to increase the growth rate. So this is very important component. All viewers have to know that we cannot keep the lamb and kid by giving some injections or feed supplements in the form of uh, yeast and probiotics or B complex or liver tonic syndrome. The major thing CHNO has to go in the summer first. Then you can give some B complex and zinc and some copper. So prepare the nice uh, <coughs> uh, bed and go for degree method of uh, uh, sowing. And uh, after say second or third day of uh, sowing, you should go for irrigation. And uh, uh, say every ten days you have to go for whatever method, either it is chip or sprinkler or whatever flood irrigation. And uh, say around sixty days and. Uh, when the yield comes, you can always go for, you know, you are harvesting and uh, taking the yield. And you can also have mechanical harvesters or manual harvester, whatever is working in your business. So with this background, I'll come to the care of newborn. And uh, because fodder is very, very essential and we have overlooked this topic. Personally, I feel that we have not given much importance and the crop residue which are devoid of any nutrients with 30%, 40% digestibility, we are doing, taking our crop production of uh, lamb and eel. So with that, uh, we are having a very tough challenge. So if we change our outlook by having good uh, crop produced and land diverted to towards water production, then we can do good justice. And we have the technology. It is not that I am talking anything out of science. It is all we have done work. We have quantified it and we have proven it. And this is what I am going to present now. The newborns, you know, they are all born with brown fat. It's something like your internal heater, which has got inborn nature has provided. And you will never see a newborn baby shivering like we adults do. And this uh, brown fat keeps the baby warm. And it does not have any thermoregulatory mechanism developed. That's why this brown fat is helping them. And temperature is getting maintained. If the baby is not getting or kid is not getting required amount of milk. It is losing its body weight by reserving, uh, by shifting the body reserves and the brown fat is using it to keep warm and the body weight is coming down. So as a thumb rule, we always say that cholesterol, which is the most important within for passive immunity, should be fed in ad limitum of quantity, whatever it is taking. And then we should go for feeding adequate amount of transition and educational yield. Here I want to say that the eve and the uh, uh, dose nutrition go together and post parturition, uh, the doe or the eve has to take care of her own health as well as the health of the new. So hence the requirement is very, very high. We don't even give 100, 200 grams in ground whenever we go to any farmer, any concentrates. And we recommend here 500 grams, sometimes 1.5 kgs also. Because you are expecting 300 grams of growth rate in case of lamb. So where is this coming from? It's coming from feed, which the E will be eating. Then that is converted to milk. And that is going to the lamb and kids. And... Uh, the psychology of the owner also depends a lot for the release of milk. Suppose the uh, owner is a very good caregiver. You know, he's a very good at animal husbandry. So we have seen that the lambs and kids are very, very healthy, with very good wool, 
get very uh, happy lambs, very healthy lambs, roaming around with kicking and dancing. But we have also seen that if the owner is slightly nervous and you know he is showing, uh, that gets transmitted to the animals also. So and the production of the milk and also gets compromised. And uh, this is out of my own experience. I'm telling you that if uh, generally after the lambing or kidding, if you see for any choreo amnionitis or the smell or bad smelling placenta, so that is a sign for you know uh, warning that uh, the lamb or kid is going to be having sepsis and it needs uh, antibiotic treatment and all. So if 95% or 99%, it will not be having any infection. But one odd case or say uh, once one in 200, 300, you know, we can easily catch at a uh, very early time and we can uh, avoid that mortality by giving it very good antibiotic. And the low birth weight also. The challenges for us is preterm, low birth weight and choreomnitis. That is ascending infection if it has got. If these three things are normal, it has got a adequate uh, 7, 8, 10 percent of the birth weight. Uh, used body weight as birth weight. And it is full term, say 155 days. And there is no sepsis. So we can easily rest, relax and uh, rest or leave it to the mother. She will do the very good nursing. You don't have to panic. So here are some of the data and statistics. They are very important. You know, whenever we are talking of any scientific uh, rearing method, so we must always have these kind of data. So when is the lamb mortality happening? So here we can see that the first seven days are very, very crucial. Whatever mortality is happening is happening in during this time. And after that, you know, there will not be any, any mortality at all. Or if at all it is there, it is very less. Right? So say first seven days, then up to eight to 30 days, we have got very good challenges. We have to be alert what I need to do. And what are the causes of mortality? If you see that, these are the causes of mortality and all these causes of mortality are related to one in one or the other way to milk production of the eve and to the dough. See, highest mortality is happening because there is starvation. There is no good amount of milk available. And since I said they are, they are born without any reserves, so if two days they are not getting, three days they are not getting the milk, the body weight is reduced. There is no good thermoregulation happening and the animal is dying out of starvation. Why is this septicemia happening? Because the body's infection is not adequately looked after by the body's antibiotic mechanism or passive immunity. And uh, these are also, you know, they are factors related to Eve. Like uh, there is no either good mother's uh, health or there is no good milk production. That's why the, uh, the mortality is happening. And again, I said, you know, like uh, if the lamb is not getting adequate milk or space and all, no, they get either neural ill or physical damage or some other reasons. So I must say that all these causes of mortality, what Karim and Sankhyan has uh, uh, reported, they all are in our hand. We can uh, reduce or control and bring it to the mortality to less than uh, uh, good figures. And we have done it actually ourselves in our last 20 years of work and out of experience we are telling with confidence this. So here is a thumb rule how to you know uh, take up our lamb and kid rearing is that uh, try uh, this uh, colostrum uh, as early as possible because it is rich in total solids 40 percent almost and uh, it has got good uh, you know goblins and uh, first two hours you know the, it uh, gets into the blood and gives you that perfect uh, passive immunity. And thereafter, say around, you must aim for getting at least 15 to 20 percent of the uh, lamb's body weight as milk available to the lamb. Then we can have this uh, good growth rate, what other Western countries are uh, trying to get around, say, 250 grams, 300 grams. Then we can get, otherwise, I'll tell our figures, what are our figures. And uh, we have seen that, you know, if you can go for, say, uh, some change in our outlook. You have a group uh, feeder. Uh, now these devices are available in the market. You have 20 lamps. You have 20 bottles. And all uh, you know fitted at the level of uh, the head. So that it raises its neck. So soon after suckling to the mother. There is no adequate milk available with the mother. So it will leave it. If we can train 
to a master trainer, elder lamb, to go to that uh, uh, bottle feeder, all will go and start, you know, uh, suckling that bottle feeder and they'll get the required amount of milk. So this is what I we want to emphasize here, that, that uh, the milk has to be adequately getting into the lamb or kid's stomach. Or else we have to go for artificial means of feeding. It can be either cow's milk or any uh, reconstituted milk from powder and all. Only thing is it should be a very <coughs> safe and healthy and clean. Okay. And uh, say by 6 to 10 days, which is the most crucial period where we have got almost 40%. I have told in the last slide that we have almost 64% of the mortality in this uh, 6 to from 0 to 6 days. So if we can give adequate milk, we can have same thing. And from 7th day to 2 months, we can go for again say 15 to 20 percent of the body weight as milk and soon after circling we are not even getting five percent of the body weight now so rest can be made up from you know the artificial devices which are uh, hung at uh, heads level and kept in one corner so group feeding they all each learn from each other okay? and short the supply can be always made from the this kind of uh, apparatus and uh, you can also start some dry feed or tea feed by 15th day and greens by 30th day because generally the Roman development is complete by two to three months. Uh, we can say that uh, if you introduce uh, the tea feed as early as possible, even not even 15 days, you can always go for second, third, fourth day if you introduce the tea feed and greens. So that will do the colonization of bacteria, it will allow the papillae to grow in the rumen and the rumen development takes place as early as possible. So we have done one small thing so that uh, the we started feeding to our lambs at second, third day onwards. So we recommended that by 36 days we can wean the lambs and pigs. And what is your target? Suppose you want to take 100 grams, I will gain 200 grams, 7 will gain 300 grams, I will gain or 200. So it also depends on the, the ease body weight. So if that is the case, because the genetic potential has to be there among the ease for the lambs to grow. Now, if you take Black Bengal or Mandya breed, which is there in Karnataka or Deccanic breeds, they have around 20 kg body weight. Now, you cannot expect this uh, growth rate there. That potential has to be there. Only then you can exploit the potential fully. Otherwise, we have to go for low average body gain, say around 100 grams. So, in that case, you have to go for feeding at least 250 grams of concentrates and say 2 to 2.5 kgs of greens only then because this green as i said it is 90 percent moisture say around uh, hardly 250 grams of primary intake is coming from here and another 250 is coming uh, from the concentrate so daily 500 grams concentrate so you can have for every 2.5 grams we can say you will get one gram got body weight gain so this will uh, take care of the, the uh, average daily gain and the target is high, so you have to keep on increasing the content. So please don't now uh, be nervous and panic because I had seen that, you know, whenever we say that this much of content has to be fed, you know, people say, oh, this will have acidosis, so it will have problem. How can you think? No. If you're going for high yield, and I'll substantiate this with my, you know, data, what we have collected in our uh, research work, the, that uh, our PG students have done excellent work. And uh, here we try to first identify what is the yield coming by this simple method of way suckle way method, you know, where we could allow the lamb to suckle the mother and then post uh, suckling also we took the weight. So the difference was basically the yield. And we also did the milk composition analysis uh, and uh, we wanted to see how much is uh, coming and what is the composition of the milk yield and how much is actually translated into body weight. I want to tell you that uh, this uh, we got an average uh, ease weight of around say 27 kgs and 2 kgs lamb weight. Okay, don't get uh, confused with these uh, data which is uh, uh, slightly not uh, liked by anyone, uh, these tables and all. Uh, but uh, here, what I want to tell you is that this is the figure, actual figure. So science all depends on data. So 27 kg was the average body weight we got for lamb, a ease and 2.1 kg. So roughly you can say 7 kgs of the leaves body weight was our lamb's milk. And 
we also quantified the cholesterol intake right uh, by having uh, six two hours six hours and 12 hours and 24 hours milk intake in the lamb by that method what i told you that the way settle way method you allow it to settle then take uh, the weight of the lamb post settling this gives you a very very crucial and very nice data see what the amount of cholesterol which is going is just 30 grams as against the requirement of we say that 5% should go or 10% should go. So 10% is almost 200 grams. An entire 24 hours, this much is going. So we are having still a lot of uh, challenges in front of us to work because this is very essential for us. And uh, then we saw the yield of the actual uh, dam for eight weeks almost. Now we, want, we are interested in knowing what how much is the milk coming. So, if you see, yield is, uh, it depends on uh, the lamb. Some have got as low as, say, around 210 grams also. And some got a very, very high yield of, say, around 500 grams, 500 ml of milk. The average is 300 ml. So, this is the average of, uh, I, I must say that, uh, of the whole flock, 300 ml. And what is the milk we are getting in the first week? Second week, this is of very, very important. You know, I am getting almost, uh, say, 420 ml of milk in the second week, which is the peak yield. But generally, we have, uh, in the case of cattle, we have a peak yield of around five, six weeks. But here it is, at second week only, we are getting peak. And the yield is very high, say, 420 ml. Uh, with the body weight, I am not telling high or low, because we have we have quantified, we have understood the science now. It is only thing is you have to scale it up. And uh, so that means the mill can be raised for further from here. That is what I want to emphasize here. And uh, this is a much wonderful lactation curve. So you can see that peak has come at uh, set two weeks and uh, the took almost to almost. So you can say 420, 430 ml. And by eight weeks, we could get the production got reduced to almost 200 ml. So when we used to do winning, uh, the production got to almost 190 grams and all, right? And then we did the uh, composition. This is a very nice value which should all uh, be known that it is a simple uh, uh, composition method which you do in our nutritional lab, second year BVSC basics. So we got a 20% almost uh, total solids, and these solids are really going into the body weight again. You can uh, so nicely correlate, you know, 303 ml and 20% uh, solids. So that comes to almost 60 grams of total solids and that was converted into body weight gain. So what I want to tell you is that the more is the milk yield and the total solid content of it. So much of, uh, you know, gain we can take it. So here it's a nice thing. Anyone who wants to learn that the fat content is almost 8% linkage, it's highest linkage of sheep. So this is our figure of uh, concern that uh, we have a very good average daily gain of, uh, say, 68 grams. We are getting a uh, average daily gain of 68 grams, which can be seen by this uh, figure. Last figure uh, that only you have to see. Don't get confused. I will not show any table after this. You know, so be relaxed. Uh, the data is very important for us to understand any subject well. So we got 68 grams as average daily gain for all these 20 lamps. So some might have grown by almost say 100 grams and all. So my concern is this: you know that if we can add this is the genetic potential, say around 112 grams and all. So, so this, if you are getting 112 grams in uh, second week when the peak yield is there, so we can take, uh, uh, say around say 125, 150 grams also because the milk is not coming uh, from the mother side. So you can see that the growth is also coming slowly, and it is dependent on the mother. And we could get 29 grams also in the last, right? So this is the growth rate we got. And uh, this is the last uh, slide, uh, which I'll show you about tables and all. So what here uh, we want to show is that uh, the animal, uh, we also took one more experiment parallel to that along with the yield. Animal, that if at all the animals, eaves, especially the mothers, are supplemented with, uh, say we supplemented with two kgs of uh, leucine to the eave. And uh, we wanted to see how much of weight the mother is losing. So unsupplemented group almost lost 2.5 kg, whereas the supplemented group 
is losing 1.4 kgs only. Because that means what I want to emphasize is that the nutrient intake is not at all being met. And this is the reason for our poor thinking. So the whole summary from the whole uh, work, what uh, last uh, four or five years we worked on this uh, lamb and kid mortality and uh, wanted to understand the whole subject well. So we want to summarize here, it is like that, that the birth weight is around 7.5% of the body weight of uh, beef and uh, average milk yield is 3 ml. So the range is 420 ml also, like, you know, the main, it is lowest is this much and highest is this much. And uh, growth rate, what we got was 68 grams. So here we have a total solid content of 20 percentage and 303 ml milk yield. So this, when put together, is converted into this uh, growth rate. So the entire total solids are going for its growth and uh, some amount is lost, say, for maintenance. So this is what I wanted to emphasize. We also got an uh, average daily gain of 112 grams in second week. Because we know peak yield is there and the milk yield is there. So we can also take it, say, what I want to say is that 125, 150 should be our target uh, in uh, this body weight of Eves. So potential is there. Uh, because the inputs are not there, it's not getting. And uh, the Eve also lost 65 grams per day. And the, this was converted into lamb's body weight. So we have a system of production where uh, the generally uh, you don't have any flushing or you have only grazing system. This is uh, I'm talking about Indian system of production system where it, their animals are put on just purely on natural resources, grazing and all. So that's why these are data are there. So uh, the whole body weight is converted into a uh, uh, lamb's body. Weight. This is what I want to concur, derive my conclusion or influence from this. And uh, uh, we uh, did one more parallel third experiment in this that we wanted to uh, feed to the lambs also uh, along with milk lucent. So we fed them uh, uh, along with the mother we also fed to the lambs also and this was the we partitioned how much of growth is coming from milk and how much is coming from lucent that we want we partitioned with just five lambs uh, and uh, out of our curiosity and interest and we could get that we could get that you know they are getting gain from 46 grams from milk and even 36, 31 grams from lucent. So with that, we wanted to tell that, you know, the growth is picking up. There are no nutrients available with the eve. So instead of waiting for eight weeks, we can go for, say, four weeks also, or five weeks also for the weaning of these lambs because they are now independent and they can be fed well. If you don't feed, they'll not survive. That is a different story. But you have to be knowing that, yes, uh, the Human microbes are establishing, rumen is getting developed. So, say around 36, 42 days or 47 or 56, what is the standard now? We can be appropriate. And with one more work, in large ruminants, we wanted to quantify. Here, we got that the same result, right? You know, around 5% of the body weight is colostrum, which is actually going in the stomach of a calf. Uh, in the first suckling, which is supposed to be the strictest sense, you know, this is the time where passivity gets developed. And uh, literature says 10% should be our intake. But even if we say second suckling also, we go, so it is 5%. And rest all, we do to our ignorance and lack of knowledge, we are hand milking and discarding. Actually, the in case of uh, buffaloes, when the feeding is all well taken, we have got 14% of the body weight is the colostrum yield. But only 5% is going in its stomach. The rest all farmers have a habit of discarding it due to the fear of diarrhea. So these are the actual photographs of the work we conducted. And these are the weight gain we got. Uh, but I told you that, you know, the, along with milk, we wanted to see what is the, great, the growth which is coming from feeding them concentrates also. So we are getting extra growth rate due to that treatment, small work. So this uh, 7 to 8 experiment we did. To understand the real data and figures. So, with that, I wanted to you know wrap it up the whole uh, <clears throat> thing by saying that ruminants we all know uh, they have a rumen and energy is most important factor. Uh, the for so long we have been talking a lot on protein. Protein is needed for rumen, if not for ruminants. If you pro provide adequate amount of energy in the rumen, it is converted into microbial biomass and it can give you good growth rate. So in our case, 
and those commercial farmers and all who are going for better genetics and better feeding, they can have still better uh, growth. And uh, if not anything working, right, you can go for at least soaking some GNC or uh, you know, zinc sulfate, urea and all these things are must because the, our system is on zero input like all the animal production system for so long. So in that case only we can do some magic by giving some you know, magical elements such as nitrogen, you know, zinc and copper. And otherwise the potential is this much. If you want to keep sirohi or beetle type of animal which has got adult body weight of around 80 kgs, 90 kgs. So, so much of potential is there. What I mean to say is that since our body weight is very short, so at least this much target we should be getting. And uh, since zinc is a cofactor involved in many digestive enzymes, we have seen very good results by application of just 1 to 2 gram, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 gram per animal per day application of zinc sulfate. Which is available easily available in the market, a very, very low, just a pinch per cow. 0.2 gram per sheep and goat can give you very good results. And uh, say if you are going for crop resilient strawberries, or you know, adding some uh, urea 46%, it has also very good magical result, no doubt in it. And people should not have any inhibition saying that you know it is uh, not good. It's a, it is a pure side of the right? it's 46% nitrogen and uh, multiplied with the uh, 6.25, you know, one uh, uh, grams of uh, this thing can give you protein worth at least half kg of GNC. That is what we want to tell here. So, if it is uh, fed on uh, crop residue, and always go for if at all you are doing any supplementation on feeding and in Indian grazing system, go for aiming because the small uh, thing we understood only after doing an experiment for almost uh, six months that you know we are doing wrong feeding. Morning feeding, we are feeding and we are selecting them for. Grazing. They just went round and round, changed that. And then we changed our time of feeding. And that day it started giving you at least 40% more growth rate. Otherwise, the growth rate was almost same as that of treatment and control. So, so small, small things, you know, we sometimes uh, overlook and uh, we take it for granted being so well educated also. So, this uh, simple thing of adding urea, zinc, crop residue, and GNC soap water and all has got a really magical effect in Indian rearing system. And if you want to go for, uh, you know, commercial production, zero grazing, future is very, very bright. That is what I want to tell you here to all the viewers, that the future is very bright. You can take whatever your target is, but it should be matching with the inputs. That is what we are more interested to tell you, that 5% of dry matter intake can be put in the uh, stomach of lamb and eve. If that is the case, then we have got a growth rate of say 200 grams. And uh, right now we are getting very less. This is the highest we got. So that is the potential and it can still be taken if we, we have taken it second week. So if uh, say third week uh, our milk yield was say around 550 ml, it would have gone to 250, uh, 150 grams per day also. And uh, sheep and goat, we are all lucky that uh, it is a new sector, emerging sector. Not much has been done, and the prices are very good. In case, see, if you see the milk, you know, Dr. Varghese Kuren has got a very good name, which is wide market. In case of poultry, also, we are at European standards or world standards, thanks to Dr. B. B. Rao. This is also uh, ready to be explored. This whole sector is ready to be explored. And uh, if we do that, we make the required amount of protein oil for our country which are actually needed, you know, for the efficient uh, living purpose and all. And Dr. Vargis Kuren was known very famously for this one thing that the actual work is just 15% and we are giving 100% of our attention to it. Rest 80-85% lies outside, you know, he, he, he used to, he worked in Anand and he created that magic just to understand the society, he used to create democracy in the society, he used to create, empower the people, he used to empower the women, he used to make them owners of the cooperative society. That's how we created the white relation. So if we also can understand the human aspect well, we can also be doing a great job here. Nature has provided everything, but our under knowledge to understand is lacking. And sometimes we are overdoing these things and complicating by trying to overdo all these things. So we have to simplify and uh, move ahead. That is the thing. Like that. 